To listen to the full audio series, install the Pocket FM app now. Episode 127. What is she? Ah, cried Granger. A line of blood gradually appeared on his face. It started on his forehead and ran down to his chin. At first, a slow stream of blood flowed out, but soon it was gushing out. His eyes were wide open as he stared at the old woman in horror. Alex was also stunned. He saw a cold light flash past his eyes, and then he saw that it was the knife lying a few inches away from him. It was still dripping blood. Then, to his horror, he watched the old woman kneel on the ground and press her head against Granger's head. He watched her start to suck blood from the corpse's head. The sound of her sucking was terrifying. Alex was rigid with fear watching the scene in front of him. He didn't dare to move, afraid that the old woman would stab him if he turned his back. A minute later, she raised her head. She used her finger to wipe the blood away from her lips and murmured, It tastes pretty good. Those words caused Alex's hair to stand on end, while his heart was in overdrive. You, the old woman said as she looked at Alex. I just watched her kill someone and drink his blood, he thought. I'm sure she'll kill me next. While well, I'm standing up and she's still on the ground, I've got to use my advantage to hurt her if I can. It's my only chance to escape. His heart trembled as he raised his leg and kicked her as hard as he could. But before he could get to the door, his legs went limp and he sat on the ground. Suddenly, he heard a clank. He looked up to see that the kitchen knife that had just killed Granger was now impaled in the side kitchen cabinet a few inches from his face. Warm blood from the knife dripped onto his arm. The old woman was standing over him. She said, Seeing that you saved my life just now, I'll let you live. Now we're even. There was mockery in her eyes. She seemed to be laughing at him for thinking he could beat her. Alex could hardly believe what he was hearing. Her voice had changed. She no longer had the frail voice of an elderly woman, but the strong, strident voice of someone decades younger. Her eyes had also become focused and sparkling. The woman went to the open window. Did she come in through the window? Alex wondered as he noticed that the glass was broken. What is she going to do now? Is she really going to jump out of the window? But we're on the ninth floor. Unbelievably, it did look like she was intent on jumping out of the window. So Alex shouted, Stop! But the old woman was gone. Alex ran to the window and looked out. He was dumbfounded. The woman hadn't fallen to the ground as he had feared. Instead, she seemed to be floating down like an action movie superhero. She landed on the main steps of Vivian's building, took a few steps, and then disappeared. Alex continued looking down in a daze. He just couldn't comprehend what he had just seen or believed that it was real. When he came back to his senses, he looked at Granger lying on the floor. The blood on his head had already dried up, and there was no new blood flowing out. It was as if the old woman had sucked it dry. He walked around the body and out of the kitchen. Alex! Vivian had walked back into the apartment. When she saw him, she walked up to him quickly to check if he was injured. What about Granger? Vivian asked anxiously. Dead, Alex said as he looked toward the kitchen. Dead? Surprised, Vivian walked slowly to the kitchen door. When she opened it, she saw Granger lying on the floor. What happened? She asked, trying to suppress her disgust. Then she thought, Dale Granger was one of the leaders of the flag sect. When they find out what's happened, they'll kill us all. She said, we have to get away quickly before the flag sect people come looking for us. She held Alex's hand and tried to pull him to the door. Alex pulled her back and replied, Vivian, don't worry. His death was nothing to do with you. Trust me, I'll take care of it. 
In an anguished voice, she said, Oh, why don't you understand? He's one of the main guys from the flag sect. When they find out, they will kill us. Don't you understand? Vivian couldn't believe that Alex was being so naive. She thought he was an ignorant college student who knew nothing about society. Alex held Vivian's shoulder and said calmly, Listen to me. I know you don't believe me, but please trust that every word I'm saying right now is true. Even if they think I killed Dale Granger, Flag Sect won't dare to come after me. Seeing how sure Alex was, Vivian didn't know what to say. All right, now you and Monica stay at the hotel and I'll handle everything here, he said. And then he put his arm around Vivian's shoulder and they walked out of the apartment. In the entrance lobby, they found Monica waiting anxiously. Alex found them a room at a hotel nearby and settled the mother and daughter in there. When he left the hotel, Alex called a cab and went back to the Azalea guest house. When he arrived, he asked for Sam Woodsworth to come and see him. Alex, you... Sam stopped when he saw the state Alex was in. It's nothing, Alex reassured him. His appearance was the least of his concerns at that moment. His only focus was the dead body in Vivian's apartment. The body needed to be dealt with before the police got involved. If that happened, the media attention would be impossible to suppress. He said quietly, In number two Bayview Villas, apartment number 903, there's a dead body in the kitchen. The body is Dale Granger, one of the leaders of the flag sect. Send someone to deal with it immediately. Yes, sir. Sam was frightened when he heard what he had said. He wasn't scared of the flag sect, but of the impact that this could have on Alex. He was terrified to think of the danger that Alex was now in. He quickly instructed one of his subordinates to dispose of the body, and then went back to Alex and sat down next to him. He said, I'm so sorry, Alex. I was supposed to protect you. Can you forgive me? Forget it. It's fine, Alex reassured him. No one could have predicted what had happened tonight. Even if he had been killed, it wouldn't have been Sam's fault. Finally, Sam stood up, and Alex asked him, I know the man who was killed was one of the leaders of the flag sect. Is handling it going to be a problem? Sam replied confidently, The flag sect has only just been formed. It was only because we managed to eradicate the Azure Dragon Society that the flag sect rose to prominence. In comparison, annihilating these amateurs will be easy. Sam didn't seem concerned at all. Since they've caused these problems, how about we completely eradicate them? Sam suggested. Not for now. Let's just wait until this matter is settled first, Alex said after thinking for a while. An hour later, Sam went to see Alex with the news. The situation has been dealt with, and our people have also eliminated any surveillance on you. According to our intelligence department, Dale Granger has no relatives, so no one will report him missing to the police, and the only people who will notice his absence are the people from the flag sect. If we hear any more news about this, we'll deal with it immediately. Thank you. You've done well. Go and get some sleep now. I'm tired too. Finally, Alex could relax. Exhausted, he went back to his room to sleep. Over the next two days... Alex didn't hear any more about Granger's death. It seemed to have never happened. Vivian and Monica had been staying in the hotel, while Alex had been scrutinizing the movements of the flag sect. According to Sam's observers, the gang had started sending people to search for Granger. On the third day, Alex left the Azalea guest house and got on a cab to go to the hotel to see Vivian and Monica. By the time he arrived, Alex felt a little hungry and decided to go and get some breakfast first. A small restaurant called the Bayview Diner attracted his attention. The quaint exterior and the fluttering banner outside made him feel like the diner had been around since the 50s. Business in the diner seemed to be pretty good. It was almost full. He ordered a bowl of beef soup and took a seat at a booth in the corner. Out of the blue, the customer in the next booth said, so beautiful. She's a goddess, agreed the waiter. Alex looked up and saw a petite girl walk in and head toward an empty table. He couldn't see her face from where he was sitting, but her red clothes were familiar. 
When she turned and sat down and Alex had a clear view of her face, he couldn't help but choke and spit a mouthful of beef soup onto the table. The beautiful young lady was only around 16 years old, and she had exquisite dark eyes under long, curved eyelashes. Her cheeks were pink, her lips were thin and tender, and she had her silky hair tied back in a bun. Alex couldn't believe what he saw. This woman was wearing the same clothes as the old lady who had killed Dale Granger at Vivian's home three days ago. He knew it was the same woman. He lowered his head to drink the soup. He was very nervous, but he was also confused. He had witnessed her killing someone and knew that she had abilities way beyond those of normal people. What if she wanted to silence him? Also, how had she turned from a very elderly lady into a beautiful adolescent? Then the girl noticed Alex sitting in the corner booth, and a trace of a smile appeared on her face. Alex froze, but she only glanced at him once before looking away. She called out to the waiter, Why hasn't my beef soup arrived yet? Her voice no longer sounded like that of an old woman, but was the voice of a teenage girl. It was also very calm and very cold. Episode 128, A Teenage Grandma Hey, beautiful, here's your beef soup, said the owner of the diner, as he brought a steaming bowl of soup over to the girl. Alex was surprised as he thought, the girl didn't even give her order. How did the waiter know what she wanted to eat? The owner smiled as he put the bowl down in front of her, and then he turned to go back to his work. The girl picked up a spoon and took a sip of her broth. Her eyebrows knitted together, and she emitted a loud, Yuck! and pushed the bowl of soup off the table. What kind of soup is this? It's terrible. Get me another bowl, she ordered aggressively. Why did you have to do that? The owner said when he saw the mess of beef soup and the broken pieces of the bowl all over the floor. You need to control your temper. You can't come into my diner, tell everyone that my soup is bad, and then smash my bowl. You'll ruin my business. The teenager raised her gaze to look at the man as she said, Are you talking to me? The coldness of her gaze made him shudder. Her hand gripped her fork, seeming to want to stab the man with it. Alex, who was sitting nearby, watched the scene and felt his heart tighten. He had already witnessed this girl's terrifying strength. If she were to use this fork on the man in some way, he would at the very least be severely injured. At that moment, a young man stood up and walked over to the owner of the diner, saying, Why are you talking to a customer like that? If she says your food is bad, then it's bad. He looked at the girl with a smile and asked, beautiful lady, their beef soup is bad. I advise you not to have another one, but I'll treat you to whatever else you want from the menu. He was blown away by the girl's beauty and wanted to take the opportunity to strike up a conversation. You're going to treat me? Seeing that the young man was trying to please her, the girl smiled playfully. Then get me a Caesar salad. Did you hear that? Caesar salad, quickly. The man went and sat down at her table. Close up, she looked even more beautiful. He was elated. When the salad was served, the young woman ate slowly, one forkful at a time. Everyone in the restaurant glanced at her. As she was eating, her every movement was pleasing to the eye. What do you think of the salad? The man asked, feeling bold. He was sure that he could woo this beautiful young woman. Paying for her salad was the first step in his plan to win her over. He did not doubt that in less than three days he would be able to coax her into bed. As he spoke, he slid his hand along the table toward hers. He just couldn't resist the sight of her tender white fingers. He felt that if she let them hold her hand, he knew that he would win. The girl merely glanced at his hand reaching for hers and didn't react at all. She calmly continued to eat her salad. Just as the young man's hand was about to touch hers, the corner of her mouth curled up into a cold smile. She scooped up a nut from the salad, and with a flick of her wrist, 
it flew like a bullet straight into the young man's eye. Ah! He screamed as he fell to the ground. He was clutching his eye as blood flowed out from between his fingers. My eye! My eye! He cried. Now the young man understood how dangerous this woman was. But he had no time to be frightened. He just wanted to get to the hospital as quickly as possible to see if his eye could be saved. As he staggered out of the restaurant, he was watched by the incredulous crowd. What's going on? One man asked. Why is his eye bleeding? Do you know? Asked his friend. The first man replied, I don't know, I didn't see anything. No one else could understand what was happening. Only Alex, who had been sitting in the corner watching, had seen everything and was shocked. He knew what the girl had done. The teenager leisurely finished her salad, stood up and was about to leave when the owner stepped in front of her. You haven't paid for your food yet. A bowl of beef soup and a Caesar salad. That's $18, he said. Having me eating in your diner should be payment enough, yet you still dare to ask me for money? Just get out of my way. She replied with a scowl. She was about to push him aside and leave. But the man wouldn't give in. He remained standing in front of her and said, Hey girl, where are your manners? What makes you so special that you don't have to pay for what you've eaten? One of the other customers piped up. Yeah, why aren't you paying for your meal? Which high school are you from? Didn't your teachers teach you any manners? Another said, She's so beautiful, but she doesn't have the slightest bit of class. This is a small business and you need to pay for your food. If you don't want to pay, we'll make you, said another man. The other customers in the diner also supported the owner. Although they found the woman attractive, they were still thinking rationally and felt that she should pay her bill. The girl's eyes swept across the crowd as she asked them, And who exactly is going to make me do it? There wasn't a shred of cowardice or panic in her voice. She seemed calm and determined. What the customers didn't know was that the girl already had dozens of razor blades hidden in her hands. Somehow, she managed to hold them all without getting a single cut. Alex spotted the flash of the blades in her hands and had a terrible premonition that everyone in the shop was about to die. Let me help her pay, he said without any hesitation as he squeezed through the crowd and rushed in front of her. It's only $18. I'll pay her bill and mine as well, he said to the diner owner with a smile. He transferred the money to him using his cell phone. Is that settled now? Great, then we'll go, he said as he looked at the girl. She was observing him playfully. He smiled awkwardly and said, Ma'am, I've paid the bill. Let's go. Alex had seen her as an old woman, so without thinking, he called her ma'am. With a humph sound, the girl put the blades back into her sleeve and walked out with him. One of the customers muttered behind her as she left, I can't believe that girl was so obnoxious. I blame her upbringing. With a puck sound, something hit his chest, and the man immediately fell to the ground. The pain felt like a nail had been hammered into him. With the other customers watching in fascination, the man pulled the thing from his chest and saw that it was a bead. It's hers, he said, remembering that the woman was wearing a string of beads around her wrist and that this bead matched the others on her bracelet. Everyone in the diner was astounded, and as they watched the girl leaving with Alex, they couldn't help but feel a lingering fear. Well, that was generous of you, the girl said to Alex chirpily. Yes, he agreed, worried that she was still planning some sort of revenge on him. The more he looked at the adolescent walking beside him, who now resembled a high school student, the more astonished he became. How could she have turned from an old woman into a young one? Standing next to her, he felt deeply uncomfortable. They'll all die, she said casually. That sentence from the mouth of a schoolgirl should have been funny, but Alex inhaled sharply. Ma'am, how did you become like this? Alex asked cautiously. Seeing that she was looking at him with curiosity, 
his heart tightened. He said quickly, It's fine if you don't want to tell me. Ah, there's no need to be so afraid of me. Perhaps I'll ask for your help at some point. It's very simple. I've become young again because when you first saw me, I'd been injured. But then I drank the blood of that bastard Granger. You were injured and then drank blood? Do you practice martial cultivation? Alex asked in surprise. As a well-educated descendant of a good family, he had heard of this mystical art of obtaining immortality, but he had never met someone who practiced it. Martial cultivation? Hmm. The girl smiled mysteriously as she listened to him. She didn't deny it, and he didn't dare to ask any more. What did you say you needed my help for? He asked, puzzled. He couldn't think of how he could be any help to her. You're clearly from a powerful family. Seeing Alex's slightly surprised expression, she continued, It seems that the unlucky bastard who I killed three days ago was someone quite important in the flag sect. It's been only three days and no one seems to have reported his death. What do you need my help with? Alex felt increasingly confused. The girl stared at Alex and said, I want you to let me stay at your place for a while. Don't let anyone disturb me, and you need to bring me live chicken every day. Alex was stunned. The woman was a dangerous person, and he didn't want her to stay in his home. She was unperturbed by his hesitation. She guessed, You're afraid that I'll kill you? It's true that I've killed countless people over the last few decades, and human life is worthless to me. But I'll make you a promise. As long as you do as I say, I promise I won't hurt you. Okay, ma'am, I'll do as you say, he replied. He didn't see how he could object. If he didn't agree, she could take his life in a second. Smart boy, Alex. Now take me to your house, she said with a smile. So, you know that my name is Alex. What should I call you? Alex asked. Okay, since you want to call me something, you can call me Grandma, she answered calmly. Alex couldn't help but be embarrassed. It seemed that he had landed a teenage grandmother. Undoubtedly, this young woman was the elderly lady he had seen before. He had no choice but to find a cab and take Grandma back to his villa in Green Island Garden. On the way, they stopped to buy a live chicken as she had demanded. Once he had dropped her off, he wanted to go to the hotel to check on Vivian and Monica, but as he was leaving the villa, Carl Cooper called him. Where have you been? He asked. I haven't seen you in the dorm for a few days. Listen, Ben's sister's coming for a visit. Why don't you come over and meet her? Episode 129, Tourists in New York Ben's sister's coming? Alex was pleasantly surprised. They all knew that Ben had a sister who is currently in high school and that he was living frugally in university to save money for her to continue her studies. Every time he called home, he would only tell his family the good news and say not to worry about him. When his roommates heard this and saw him living on instant noodles, they were touched and sad. Ben's sister was coming. Alex wanted to go and support his friend so she could see how popular her brother was. He arrived at the dormitory and greeted his friends. As usual, Joe, who spent a lot of time working out in the gym, teased him a little. Ben, who didn't usually pay much attention to his appearance, had been to the barbers. He looked very handsome, wearing a white short-sleeved shirt, a pair of beige shorts, and white sneakers. He looked very much smarter than usual. He also looked a little uncomfortable. Carl put his arm around Ben's shoulder and said, Alex, did you know this kid is hiding something from us? In the last two days, we've caught him buying expensive clothes and paying attention to his appearance. He also lies in bed every day playing with his cell phone. Joe and I have hardly seen him. He continued, Today he got up and showered before dawn and dressed in smart clothes. Joe and I wanted to know what he was up to, so we asked him. He finally told us. He told us that his sister is coming to New York to take part in a competition, and while she's here, she's coming to visit him. We've seen his sister's picture, and she's really pretty. Apparently, he's getting himself all dressed up like a movie star just to go and meet his sister. Carl slapped the back of Ben's head. Okay, Ben, don't tell us, but then we won't be able to help you, Alex said as he sat down next to him. 
He tugged at his friend's clothes and said, A Brooks Brothers shirt, Tommy Hilfiger shorts, and Puma shoes. How much did you spend on all this? Alex let go of his clothes and Ben straightened out the creases. It was the first time he had worn such expensive items and he felt so good. He didn't want the clothes to be ruined. He looked at his friends with an embarrassed smile. The shirt was $200, the shorts $250, and the shoes $300. Ben saw Alex and Carl looking at him in surprise and immediately explained, It's not my own money. Of course, I don't have that kind of money. They're all on credit. Buddy, it's great that you want to look good, but how are you going to pay it off? You still need money to live on. And it's not like you're going on a date. You're just meeting your little sister, Alex said. He thought Ben was crazy for buying all those expensive clothes on credit. You guys don't understand. Do you think I want to get into debt to buy clothes? Can't you see that I had no choice? Ben said awkwardly. I keep telling my family that I'm doing really well. That I earn more than $2,000 every month doing part-time work and that I have plenty of money so they don't have to worry about me. Now my sister's coming, and if she sees me dressed in rags, she'll be really disappointed, and she'll go back and tell my parents. It'll kill them to hear the truth. Ben's friends all understood his concerns. Alex said, It's fine, we were just joking with you. But you'll have to keep up the pretense while she's here. If they all think you're wealthy, if your sister finds out the truth, it'll be even worse. I still have a little money on me, around $350. I borrowed it from some friends. That should be enough. If it's not, I can still get a little more on my credit card, Ben said without any confidence. Alex sighed inwardly, but he didn't say anything. He was sure that Ben was making a mistake. After chatting for a while, they left to pick up his sister from the airport. While Ben and his friend were leaving the campus, two young ladies were walking out of arrivals at JFK Airport. One of them was Ben's younger sister, Tanya. The other was her best friend, Brittany Coleman. Listen to me, is your brother in New York really as amazing as you said he is? Brittany asked as she held Tanya's arm. Of course. Every time he calls me, he says that he's studying hard at Preston University, and he gets a scholarship every semester. In his spare time, he does part-time work for only two to three hours a day, and he gets paid more than $2,000 a month. And he's one of the most influential students at the university, Tanya said proudly. Mm, I agree that your brother sounds awesome. Brittany smiled and leaned in closer to her. She whispered, Does he have a girlfriend yet? She knew what Brittany was thinking. She touched her friend's cheek with her finger and giggled. You're so embarrassing. What are you thinking? <laughs> Brittany's face turned as red as a tomato. Why isn't your brother here yet? Brittany asked. After waiting in front of arrivals for more than 20 minutes, she was starting to get anxious. Tanya looked at her and said, Don't worry, my brother just sent me a WhatsApp message saying that he's rushing here right now. He'll be here any minute. Just then, two men wearing floral t-shirts walked over to the girls and smiled. One said to Tanya, Hey, gorgeous. You waiting for me? He had dyed blonde hair, and his friend had a dragon tattooed on his arm. Britt, let's go, Tanya said in a low voice before pulling away from the men. They looked very dangerous to her. Don't go, one of them said. The two men quickly blocked Tanya's path. They lowered their heads to look at the two girls, and one said, Is this the first time you've been to New York? Come with us. We'll show you around. He had a sinister glint in his eyes. As they spoke, they both reached out to grab the girl's hands. No, what are you doing? Tanya squealed. She and Brittany were afraid. They pulled their hands away and tried to step backwards. So, little girl, you want to have some fun? One of the men said as he grabbed Tanya's arms and pulled her into his embrace. Don't! Help! The girls shouted in panic. Let go! Get off us! At that moment... Ben, Alex, and Carl arrived. When they saw what was happening, they were furious. They didn't care who the two men were, but instantly rushed forward to help the girls. Alex kicked one of them over while Carl and Ben smashed into the other man's head, knocking him to the ground. Are you okay? Ben asked Tanya. Seeing her nod, he looked at the two men and said, 
Alex, Carl, come on, let's teach these guys a lesson. The two men saw the students charging at them ferociously. They didn't know who these guys were, and they were afraid of getting beaten up again, so they ran away. Ben walked to Tanya's side and said guiltily, I'm so sorry, did they scare you? It's all my fault, it wouldn't have happened if we'd been on time. She took his hand and said, Ben, it's fine. We don't blame you at all. You were so awesome just now that you scared those men away. Noticing that Ben's clothes were all famous brands, Tanya's heart was filled with pride. She looked at Alex and Carl and asked, Who are your friends? Alex and Carl walked over, trying to look cool. They felt like heroes in a movie, saving the beautiful heroines. Tanya and Brittany were very impressed with them. Oh, they're my roommates. This is Alex and this is Carl. Ben introduced his friends to Tanya. She smiled sweetly and said, Alex, Carl, it's good to meet you. Thank you for saving us just now. You were all so awesome. Then she introduced Brittany to Alex and Carl. Brittany sized Ben up and smiled. Ben, Tanya's told me how well you're doing at university. Looking at the designer clothes you're wearing, I'm guessing you've also earned plenty of money. Tanya and I rarely come to New York, so you must take us everywhere while we're here. Ben scratched his head in embarrassment and answered, Really? <laughs> um, well, I guess I'm doing better than most students here. You looked awkward. Alex and Carl smiled secretly. You're too modest. Where are you taking us first? Brittany asked with a smile. She was looking forward to spending time with him in New York. He was rich, so she was sure he was going to pay for everything for her. Oh, I'll take you guys to see Times Square and the Empire State Building. They're two of the things you must see in New York City, Ben said. Okay, bro, let's go, Tiny said as she took his arm and went to the roadside to call a cab. They quickly found two cabs, one for Ben, Tanya, and Brittany, and another for Alex and Carl. Ben, what kind of part-time job are you doing that you earn so much money? Tanya asked as she looked at her brother. She felt warm and happy. Brittany looked at him in anticipation. She said, you yeah, had only work for three hours a day and earn $2,000 a month. That's $50 an hour. That's amazing. Um, Ben looked embarrassed as he wiped the sweat off his forehead. Thinking quickly, he said, I'm a landscape architect and I teach people to paint. New York is a big city and rich people don't care about spending money. $50 an hour isn't much to them. So that's what you're doing. Ben, you're amazing, Tanya laughed. The more Brittany looked at Ben, the more she liked him and wanted to be close to him. She told him, I also want to study landscape architecture. By the time I graduate, you'll be high up in a big company. Then you'll be able to help me with my career. Um, we'll talk about that when the time comes. He knew that if Tanya and Brittany found out that he was lying, they would be disappointed in him. He knew that he would die of embarrassment if that happened. Ben and his friends took Tanya and Brittany to Times Square and the Empire State Building. They treated them to snacks in New York coffee shops and bought them souvenirs from the gift shops. In just a few short hours, Ben had already spent a hundred dollars. He had a little over two hundred dollars left. He wanted to treat Tanya and Brittany to a nice dinner and fancy hotel room, but he had no idea how he could pay for it. Brittany pursed her lips and said to him, Let's go. We've been walking for so long. I'm hungry. Ben, are you going to take us somewhere nice for dinner? Let's go. Oh. Ben wasn't sure what to do. He was thinking, we could just take them for a stroll around campus and then for a meal at Beautiful Cuisine, the campus restaurant. However, when Brittany asked him with such anticipation, he couldn't say anything. He felt that taking them to Beautiful Cuisine would seem so disrespectful. Ben, what's wrong? Can't you decide which restaurant to take us to tonight? It's okay, take your time to decide on the best one. After all, you've been in New York for two years. You must know loads of great places, said Brittany. She continued, Tanya and I are country bumpkins. When we get to the restaurant, we'll take photos and post them on Instagram. You mustn't laugh at us. Don't worry, Britt, my brother won't laugh. When we get there, I'm going to take photos of all the dishes we order and of the inside of the fancy restaurant. Her friends are going to be so jealous of me, having such an awesome brother. 
So far, Ben had been very generous. The girls had already spent a lot of his money since they had been in New York. Looking at their excited faces, Ben kept smiling, but inside he was panicking. He had no idea what to do next. Then Carl stepped in to try to help him. He said, Ben wants to invite you to have a meal at the seafood bar. The seafood bar was a small eatery near the campus, and it was very popular with the students. Although it wasn't as busy as beautiful cuisine or coffee palace, it usually had a good atmosphere. More importantly, considering the amount of money Ben had left, it was affordable. The seafood bar? What's that? Brittany took out her cell phone and searched for a bit. Finally, she read out, Fresh seafood to fit everyone's budgets. From the photo of the front, it looks like a country diner like at home. Carl, I know you're joking with us. Ben wouldn't take us for a meal somewhere like that. He earns over $2,000 a month. He would never take us to eat somewhere so cheap. Ben's face stiffened as he felt even more awkward. Tanya noticed that something was wrong with him. Ben, she whispered, wondering what was wrong. Then she said, Actually, this seafood bar looks pretty good. We both like fish. Let's go there. Brittany wasn't convinced. She said, Listen, Ben doesn't need all this money, and we came all this way to New York. I think you should let your brother treat us to a decent meal. And didn't you just say you wanted to take photos to post on Instagram? This seafood bar is just like the diners back home. Everyone would laugh at us if we posted photos of that place. We can't waste our time in New York eating somewhere like that. Tanya replied, Who cares what everyone thinks? Wherever Ben takes me to eat, I'll eat. Although she was also very puzzled and a bit disappointed, she wanted to stick up for her brother. Ben, who was standing between the girls, was in turmoil. He wanted to stand up and shout, Stop arguing, I'll take you guys to the best restaurant in New York to eat. But he knew he couldn't pay for it. Alex interrupted his thoughts. Ben, stop joking with her sister. He looked at the girls and said, Before we met you, Ben had already discussed it with us. And we all decided that we're going to treat you guys to dinner at Yellow Garden tonight. What do you think? If you're not happy with that, we can go somewhere else. Uh... Ben and Carl were both shocked. Yellow Garden was a famous restaurant in New York, and it was very expensive. For five of them to eat there, Ben would need at least $600. And he had a little over 200 left. And he still had to pay for a hotel room for the girls. He looked helplessly at Alex, thinking, Alex, you must be joking. How can I afford dinner at Yellow Garden? Episode 130, No One Touches My Sister Brittany agreed immediately when she heard where they were going to eat. She said, Yellow Garden? That's a really famous restaurant. I've heard that it's really fancy. Let's go. Carl pulled Alex toward him and whispered anxiously, What are you doing to Ben? He's only got a little over $200 left to pay for dinner in their hotel. It will be terrible if he takes the girls to Yellow Garden and can't pay the bill. What do you want him to do? He'll be so embarrassed in front of his sister and her friend. I know, don't worry. Do you really think I would do anything to hurt Ben? Alex comforted Carl. To him, Yellow Garden was only a mediocre restaurant. He originally wanted to take everyone to DeLuca's or Chez Laurent as a treat, but he realized that these were too exclusive and places that Ben could never afford. He felt the best choice was Yellow Garden. It's fine, let's go, he reassured Ben as he patted his shoulder. Ben, are you going to treat us at Yellow Garden? Tanya asked. She was his sister and she could tell something was worrying him. He pretended to be relaxed as he smiled and replied, of course, Yellow Garden's really good. I'll take you guys and you can see what you think. Inside, he was panicking. How can I refuse now? I've got to pretend everything's all right, but I've only got $200 on me. What the hell am I going to do when we get there? The girls jumped into one cab and the boys into another. They all headed to the restaurant. Without the girls present, Ben could stop pretending. He could be honest with his friends. Alex, what are you trying to do to me? 
You know I don't have enough money, he said in a panic. This is my card and there's still $500 on it. It's yours, Carl said, handing a bank card to Ben. The money on it was for his living expenses, but his friend was in trouble, so he was happy for him to have it. No need. Both of you listen. I've told you I've got a plan. Ben won't be embarrassed in front of the girls. Alex smiled and continued. Ben, let everyone order whatever they want. When we settle the bill, we'll go together to pay and we'll use my bank card. He took out his Supreme Sky Metro bank card, waved it in front of them quickly, and then put it into his pocket. He didn't want his friends to look too carefully at the card and recognize it. Everyone knew that to have an account there, you needed a million dollars, and that three million was needed to open a Supreme account. Ben and Carl looked at Alex in confusion. Carl asked, Alex, how much money have you got on your card? Where's the money from? You're usually struggling for money even more than us. Deep down, they didn't believe him. He rubbed his nose and said, I've got around 8,000 in the account. I was really lucky recently. I bought 10 lottery tickets and won $8,000. He still didn't want his friends to know his real identity. Even if he told them, they might not believe him. Hearing that Alex had $8,000, his friends were relieved. They teased him a little for not telling them about the lottery win. Soon, they arrived at Yellow Garden. It was a beautiful old building. There were a lot of luxury cars parked in front, and its clientele were from the upper echelons of New York society. Ben and Carl had never been to such a high-class establishment. When they saw a group of well-dressed people walk past them, they were bewildered for a moment. Luckily, Alex took control and led them into the restaurant. Once seated, under Alex's reassuring gaze, Ben mustered up his courage and ordered 10 different specialties and ordered two expensive bottles of red wine. According to the menu, he had already spent $600. Brittany was very happy when she looked at the dishes on the table. She looked at Tanya and said, See, I knew that Ben was going to treat us to a good meal tonight. This place is way more luxurious than any restaurant at home. Of course, he's my brother. Let's take some photos for Instagram. Our friends will be so jealous, Tanya said as she held up her cell phone to take a picture of the restaurant. Everyone relaxed, smiled at the photo. The meal went very well. They all enjoyed their food and chatted amicably. Happy laughs were heard from time to time. After the main course, Alex stood up and said to everyone, You guys carry on. I need to go to the bathroom. He walked toward the restrooms. As he walked, Vivian and Monica popped into his mind. Sam had reported that the flag sect were still looking for Dale Granger, and he was worried that they would go to Vivian's home. He was relieved that he had ordered Sam to send someone to collect Vivian and Monica and take them to stay in a safe place. They probably took them to either the Azalea Guest House or to the Berkeley Hotel. While Alex was in the bathroom, a group of rowdy youths entered Yellow Garden. The leader was a young man with his hair shaved on both sides and a tattoo on his head. He was hugging a pretty girl. The young man was called Corey Davis, and his father was another one of Flag Sect's leaders. Because the Flag Sect had taken control of New York's underworld, Corey's status had risen along with it, and everyone wanted to befriend him. Corey, thanks for treating us today. How many people are coming? I only called Henry. He said he was nearby and would be here soon. It's good if there's less people. I can't stand all those ass lickers. You're right, of course. Right now, everyone in New York wants to be seen with you. We feel very honored that you chose us. They spoke in very loud and brash voices and didn't care at all if they upset the other diners. None of the customers or raiders dared to say anything. Finally, the manager went up to them with a smile to take their orders. They had attracted the attention of the entire restaurant the moment they entered the door. When they saw this group of people, Ben and Carl were dismayed. What are they doing here? Ben complained. He recognized two of the young men as the two hooligans who had harassed Tanya at the airport. 
Ben put his head in his hands. Carl also lowered his head. He felt uneasy and didn't want the men to see them. There were six or seven thugs in the group. The young man with the shaved head seemed to be their leader, and he looked formidable. Ben and Carl prayed that they would not recognize them as they passed. Then they heard, Hang on, Corey. I think I saw two familiar faces. When they got closer and saw Ben, the two hoodlums recognized him. Then Ben heard a familiar voice saying, Steve, Rich, are they the ones that beat you up? He saw another youth walking over, and a chill went up his spine. Although Darren Rogers was a university student, he had no interest in studying at all. He often hung out outside of school, and after a chance encounter, he befriended Corey and became one of his followers. Under the influence of her mother, his girlfriend Donna had dumped him. Darren turned his gaze toward Ben. For a moment, the two of them locked eyes. It was the first time that Darren had ever looked directly at any of them. He said, I know these guys. Corey, Steve Rich, let me introduce them to you. They're in my class. They're nobodies, just a couple of losers. They're so poor they can hardly afford to eat. Once when my class went on a trip to Staten Island, we all decided to go out for dinner. These two punks and their buddy Alex couldn't even afford a meal. They sat outside on a bench eating fries. They didn't like it when I took a photo of them for Instagram. <laughs> laughed one of his companions. They're that poor? asked another. The first said, That's not much better than the people on the street begging for food. Corey and his lackeys laughed loudly. Listening to Darren, Tanya and Brittany were shocked. Ben was doing very well in New York. Why did this man say he was a loser who couldn't afford to eat? Was Ben lying? Or was this boy making it up? But he's wearing designer clothes right now and he's eating it here, Steve said. Then he pointed toward Tanya and Brittany and continued, And these two pretty girls are keeping him company. My guess is that he spent a month's worth of living expenses on the clothes he's wearing. Darren didn't believe that Ben had the money to buy decent clothes. I'm amazed he found the money to bring a date here. He must be planning to spend every cent he has tonight, then live on dirt next semester. His words caused another wave of laughter. Ladies, what are you doing with worthless trash like Ben? One of his, fr one of his friends joked. Darren smiled at Tanya and Brittany and said, Maybe he tricked you with his romantic words. Do you actually believe he's wealthy or could it all just be an act? Ben felt so ashamed to be insulted by Darren in front of his sister. To be called worthless. He wanted to beat him up, but there were too many of Darren's friends there, so he stayed quiet. He felt so ashamed that he clenched his fists and wanted to find a hole to hide in. Have you got anything to say? Aren't you two even going to stick up for yourselves? You worthless pieces of crap. Steve spat out and started walking toward them with Rich. Ben and Carl were both frightened when they saw them approaching. They didn't dare to move, but just sat on their chairs with their heads lowered. What are you talking about with these two pieces of scum? Rich said as he kicked Ben's and Carl's seats so they both fell to the ground. Stand up, Steve shouted, and Ben and Carl stood up. Rich, these clothes would look good on you. Steve pulled out a knife and grabbed Ben's shirt, ready to cut it open. Ben tried to back off. These were the most expensive and best clothes he had ever worn in his life. He cherished them greatly and didn't want to lose them. You little shit. If you keep moving, I'll cut you to pieces, Steve roared. With a single slash, a big hole appeared in Ben's shirt. Ben looked at his cut shirt and felt his heart ache. He was hoping he could wear it if he attended any important events over the next few years. Now he could never wear it again. <laughs> Look at how weak that guy is. He's not even standing up for himself. What a loser. Darren laughed. Steve kicked Ben's chest. He fell back, knocked over their table, and fell onto the ground. At the same time, Carl was kicked to the ground by Rich. Brittany, 
like most of the other girls at the restaurant, was screaming loudly. Tanya, on the other hand, rushed to help Ben up. These two girls are pretty good looking. Corey let go of his girlfriend and looked at Tanya. He reached out his hand to pinch her butt. Don't! Tanya backed off in fright. She could sense how dangerous this group of men was. Come to me, pretty girl. Corey wrapped his arms around Tanya's neck and was about to pull her into his embrace. She screamed, Ah! At that moment, they all heard a shout. Don't touch her. At the same moment, Corey let out a blood-curdling howl. Ah! Something had slammed into the back of his head. He bent down with his head in his hands and took a few steps back. He finally let go of Tanya. Are you okay? Ben asked with concern as he hugged Tanya. When he had seen Corey grabbing her, he hadn't hesitated. He had rushed over and thumped him over the head. He could tolerate being humiliated himself, but there was no way he could let someone threaten his sister. No, not even the president would be allowed to touch his sister. So your brother and sister beat them both up, Corey said angrily. There's another one over there. Get her too. After Corey finished yelling, a few people rushed toward Brittany. Carl protected his sister with as much courage as Ben had shown protecting Tanya and placed her behind him to keep her safe. Carl decided that he wasn't going to let this guy make him look bad. If he was going to be beaten to death that day, they would all die together with no regrets. Ben and Carl bitterly endured the lackey's relentless fighting style, but as they were outnumbered, they probably could only last another five minutes. Tanya and Brittany weren't injured, but they were crying loudly. Tanya wanted to help her brother, but he prevented her from moving. Brittany, shielded by Carl, grabbed his shirt in fear. The people inside the restaurant could not bear to watch them fight, but felt it was out of their control, or worse, that they would get pulled into it. They didn't dare to get involved, so many of the guests quickly rushed out the door. Seeing that Ben and Carl were being beaten, Corey started to feel better. Those two losers had offended him, so this beating was the punishment that he wanted to see. Hey, what are you doing? Stop, Alex cried out. Alex rushed out of the bathroom. 
He was shocked and angry when he saw what was happening to Ben and Carl. He had left the table to call Sam Woodsworth to ask him to move Vivian Carter and her daughter to a safe place. He had only vaguely heard the sounds of a dispute outside, but he had not expected it to involve Ben's group. He saw six people surrounding Ben and Carl. Without a word, he rushed to help them. Ah! Damn! With a couple of sharp kicks, Alex knocked away two of the guys. He picked up two wine bottles from the table and smashed them over the heads of two other men with all his strength. Smash! Smash! One of the bottles shattered. The other bottle remained intact, but its bottom was stained red and dripped with blood. The two people who were hit by the bottles fell to the ground. One man held his head and swayed from side to side. The other man fell and stayed motionless with the wound on his forehead bleeding profusely. Corey, I'm dead. Steve shook his head at Corey before his eyes closed. When the other thugs saw how ruthless Alex was, killing a man in one stroke, they were all shocked. They took a step away from him and watched carefully. How are you doing? Alex looked at Ben and Carl. They both had blood on their heads, and their arms and legs were full of cuts and scrapes. Alex's heart ached as he looked at them. Tanya and Brittany's hearts moved when they saw Alex save them. Looking at his serious expression, without a trace of fear, they felt that this man had a lot of courage. Fortunately, Ben said, he was unable to open his eyes as he sat helplessly on the ground with Carl. Are you all right? Tiny's attention shifted to her brother. She hugged Ben and cried. Brittany also squatted beside Carl to take care of him. I'm okay, so long as you're okay, said Ben as he smiled. Alex thought of calling for an ambulance, but he paused. What's going on? Corey, what's wrong? Just when the fight had calmed down, another person walked into the restaurant. It was Henry Moore. Slayer followed closely behind him. He was still wearing his strange clothes and a white mask. When he saw Alex in the room, his gaze stopped on him for a few seconds. You're hurt, who hit you? Henry walked up to Corey and asked with concern. Seeing Corey look in Alex's direction and toward the rest of his group, Henry looked at Alex and revealed a cold smile. It's you again, damn it. I think you're really trying to get killed, he exclaimed. Henry, this brat is ruthless. Don't act blindly without thinking first. I've already told a few of my guys to come over and kill this arrogant guy, Corey said as he looked at Alex warily. He had only stopped by the yellow garden by chance. Corey, how could these people dare to offend you? As your friend, how can I stand it? I'll deal with these three bastards for you right now and give them something to remember. Henry looked like he could not wait to get revenge for Corey, which would help build their relationship. He turned to Corey and said, Besides, you might not know this, but this guy has hit me before. This time, whether it's for you or for me, I'm not standing by to watch him act so arrogantly in front of you. All right, you should know that his skills aren't bad. Not only that, but he can also be pretty ruthless. He's already killed one of my guys, so I'm afraid you might not be able to beat him up. Corey was rather fond of Henry and felt quite close to him. Corey, you worry too much, so what if I can't personally beat him? For people like us, we don't have to dirty our own hands to deal with this kind of trash, Harry said with disdain. He then looked over at Slayer. Just let him deal with him. Over the last few days, Slayer had almost recovered from his injuries. Henry had wondered how he could have been so badly injured by Alex at the Angel Bar the last time. Slayer had said that he'd had an absent-minded moment that had given Alex an opening. Alex was not his match at all. Henry also felt that it was by chance that Alex had beaten Slayer. Him? Corey looked at Slayer in confusion. This little guy is so short and thin. How could he beat up that brat? Corey thought. Henry, you saw it. One guy has already died. He's much stronger than you and this strange little guy. Don't let him get killed. We'd better wait for Corey's helpers, Darren said, voicing his opinion. Both Darren and Henry worked to flatter Corey's rich ego. Naturally, Darren didn't want Henry to do well in front of Corey and gain his favor, especially since Darren and Henry didn't like each other to begin with. 
Oh, Darren, don't worry so much, Henry said as he looked at him with disdain. You... Darren angrily rushed toward Henry. Ah! When he got to Henry, before he could say anything, Slayer swiftly flung Darren over his shoulder and slammed him down onto the floor. Darren cried out in pain, while Slayer calmly took his place beside Henry. Not bad. At least I know how to beat up bad guys for you, Slayer said. Henry gently stroked his head as if he were petting a dog. Good. See? My man's really strong. Go after those three and don't hold back. Kill them. I'll take responsibility. Henry said while he pointed viciously at Alex. All right. I'll do what you say. Henry felt that if he could kill Alex and his friends this time, not only would he avenge himself, but he would also earn Corey's goodwill. Henry put his hand on Slayer's shoulder and pointed at Alex. Slayer, go kill that brat for me. When you're done, I'll give you another $500 each month so you can buy more clothes and look handsome. Now hurry up and do it. Henry handed Slayer a knife and pushed him away. Slayer stared at Alex nervously, but he did not make a move. Alex just stood in front of Ben and his friends, silently looking at the little masked man. Slayer, what's wrong with you? Hurry up and kill him. Cut off his head, now, Henry shouted. Slayer remained motionless with the knife in his hand. Although no one could see his face, his eyes were wildly jumping from side to side. What's going on? Why isn't he listening to you? Corey asked Henry with a frown. Henry smiled awkwardly, walked behind the little masked man, and slapped him on the back of the head. He shouted, Trash! Don't you understand what I'm saying to you? Go and kill him now! Hey guys, Alex here. Listen to full episodes of Insta Millionaire exclusively on the Pocket FM app. Click the link in the description to install the app now.